Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues This is Session 10, Part 2 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance, still focusing on the human conscience, explaining the personal fundamental desires that must be developed by the individual, which influence and control the operation of the conscience. The session was recorded on the 9th of January 2018 from 10.30 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Desire for God's truth affects sensitivity and obedience to the conscience. Mm. Mm. So how will a desire for God's truth, either about myself or the absolute truth about anything in the universe, affect how in tune I am with the conscience mechanism? Well, obviously, this is another main critical part of the operation of our conscience. We've said right from the beginning that the operation of the conscience is God sharing truth with the human soul via this inbuilt mechanism inside of the human soul, which is called the conscience, mm -hmm. right? So God is sharing God's truth with the soul via the mechanism. Mm -hmm. Now, if I don't like God's truth, mm -hmm. if I am not in tune with God's truth, if I have no desire to know what God's truth is, Obviously, yeah. I'm going to have a huge problem yeah. with the conscience yes. and my ability to listen, firstly, to yeah. what it's saying to me, but also, secondly, to obey it, to actually yeah. do something about the truth that I've received. Yeah. I will have both problems where I'll be trying to deny what it's saying and at the same time, definitely denying acting upon what is being said. What is being said, mm. yeah. All right. Um. Can, I, can I say too that most people have uh, really just a desire to be validated. <laughs> <laughs> and what I mean by that is that they, they really want to have their beliefs confirmed of, as truth. So in other words, their personal beliefs or opinions, they want others to confirm Mm -hmm. are truthful, are right, they are, they are correct. That's what they want. That's yeah. what the average person on this planet wants. Now, there's a huge problem with that, obviously, mm -hmm. because God's not using the conscience as a way of telling you or confirming with you that your personal opinions are true and correct. Yeah. God's using the conscience to tell you his personal opinions yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of truth. What, what are the actual truths of the universe, including what is the actual truth regarding yourself? Yeah. Now, if we are just addicted to having people tell us that what we know or understand is true, yeah. then obviously we're going to really struggle with the operation of the conscience. Yeah. So, so we need to understand being addicted to the concept of personal truth and being addicted to the concept that everybody has their own truth is a major impediment to the operation of conscience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the new age philosophy that everyone has their own truth yep. is a major impediment yes. to the operation of the conscience. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that. Yeah. If we don't understand that, we're going to get ourselves into a lot of trouble with it mm. and, and therefore deny a lot of the truth that comes via the conscious mechanism. Well, and it's interesting you raise that and you mention it as a new age philosophy. It's also a, a postmodernist philosophy that there is no single truth. And it's almost like a global pandemic that everyone has said, let's give up on truth. It's the way to go. It's it's impossible to know and discern. and and. So basically what you're saying is that that kind of, it's almost accepted by a lot of people, um, or maybe I'm overgeneralizing, but there is, a, there is a large movement on the planet to sort of say, we can never really know the full truth. Um, that in itself is going to create like major disconnection between all of those people and the operation of the conscience. Oh, the operation of their conscience, yeah. Yep. The, the, the reality is it's also very hypocritical. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
the, for most people on this planet, we accept physical truth. We've discussed this in our assistance groups, yeah. how most of us yes. are open to accepting the fact that there is such a thing as electricity, for mm -hmm. example. There's such a thing as radio waves. There's such a thing as being able to transmit information over radio waves. Mm -hmm. There's such a thing as being able to fly. There's such a thing as being, you know, mm -hmm. these are all realities of life now. Yeah. So on one hand, we're very happy to receive truth that we feel meets personal benefits or personal addictions. Yeah. But on the other hand, we completely deny that absolute truth is possible in emotional and er areas of love in spirituality. Yeah. So on one hand, we're accepting that truth only exists in the physical, mm -hmm. but we're also saying right at the same time to ourselves and to others that no truth exists in the emotional or the spiritual. Yeah. This is a highly hypocritical state. Yeah. So, so a person who does this is going to struggle with anything other than physical truth. Mm -hmm. So they're very open to receiving some physical truth. And of course, God wishes to share all truth, including physical truth. Yeah. So they'll be able to receive new physical truths. Yeah. Right. But they just won't be able to receive any emotional or spiritual truths. Yeah. The sad thing, though, is emotional and spiritual truth are what brings us the emotion of happiness. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas physical truths only give us physical life changes. Yes. They don't help us experience the emotion of happiness necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas spiritual and emotional truths do that for us. Yeah. So, so the hypocrisy of saying that truth only exists in the physical, but it does not exist in the emotional and spiritual, yeah. also has the terrible penalty associated with it, which is now we have no real prospect of future happiness. Yes, yeah. We only will continue to use our physical devices and our physical knowledge to do physical things to yeah. benefit us. Yeah. But there's no real concept of true joy and happiness yeah. in the soul. So, so... It, we're doing it to our own detriment. detriment. Yeah, mm. yeah. All right. Um, okay, let's go back to uh, or keep on with uh, the what uh, what it looks like when I have a sincere desire for God's truth. Mm. And that's... here we're talking about really seeking truth sincerely from the heart with an attitude that says, whatever comes at me, I am going to listen to and I'm going to do something about it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not just what I want to hear, or, you know, yeah. it's, it's what, whatever it is I want to know. Yes. Yeah. So let, and this explains it even further, because this is what we're wanting to develop, this kind of desire in order for us to become more in tune with our conscience. Yes, a person who has an extreme, what people on earth would call an extreme desire for truth, will always be far more in tune with their conscience and therefore more in tune with God's truth than any other person will be. Mm. So, so this, is a, this is a major advantage to your life if you can develop this quality. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when I have a sincere desire for God's truth, I... Desire to receive God's truth about all matters so I can understand myself, others, my environment and God. Yes, yeah, so, so here I'm not being selective. Hmm. So mo most people when it comes to truth are very, very selective. They like to hear about one thing, but there's a whole heap of things in their life they don't want to hear anything at all about. Hmm. This is not the kind of attitude we're talking about here. To be completely open to the conscience mechanism and therefore open to God's truth being received by it, we need to get to the stage where we want to know the truth about everything. <laughs> we want to know the truth about our life, our personality, our character, you know, what mm -hmm. the flaws of our character are, what, uh, what we're doing in our day-to-day -day life, our lifestyle that has problems with it, the good things and the bad things, you know. We want to know how um, we treat each other, others, how we, how we react with people, what we do with people, what's the truth from God's perspective about that. We want to know what's the truth about our attitudes, about love and truth and desires and, and all of these things and, and in every aspect of our life. Mm -hmm. We also want to know all the external to the truths as well. You know, what, what, what are the secrets of physics and science and, and, 
and biology and all these other functionings that we know very little about still. Uh, humans know very little about it and certainly can't replicate most mm -hmm. of it. And, and obviously there'd be major benefits to our life if we could. Yeah. So we, we, we have this feeling inside of ourselves. We want to know everything, Yeah. right? And to, to get into a state where you want to know everything, you've got to almost realize like that you don't know anything. Yes. <laughs> or at or, least or, what you think. Yeah, or more up. importantly, you get have to be in a state where you go, I might know something, but I must be prepared for the fact yeah. that everything I think I know may have to be given up mm -hmm. when I receive a new truth. Yeah. And if I have that attitude, I will have a very good attunement to my conscience yes mm. <laughs> okay <laughs> all right uh um when i have a sincere desire for god's truth i desire to receive truth i want to believe the truth that i hear and i and i see the benefits of truthful knowledge don't i yes and these uh, you know firstly the desire to receive why would I have a desire to receive? Because I know that every time I receive a truth, there's a benefit. Yeah. Now, it might not be just for me. It's going to be for everyone. So, so this is a good thing. And this will increase my desire to receive it. Mm -hmm. The second thing, of course, is to act upon the things that we receive. You know, to do that, we've got to receive it and then believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's no good just receiving it going, oh, yeah, that sounds all good and well, but, you know, might be wrong too. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> How, does truth benefit me then? No, of course it doesn't. It's only when I believe it's true. Now, how do I make it a belief? Mm. I have to act upon what I originally receive and experiment with it mm -hmm. enough to know that it works yeah. before it becomes a truth. Yeah. Uh, that's what I have to do. So there's a process that I have to go through. But if I'm willing to go through this process with every new truth I receive, yeah, it's going to benefit me and mm -hmm. the world around me. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we're starting to see in a lot of these descriptions that you're giving the aspects of faith and humility, the willingness to give up um, what I currently perceive to be true, mm -hmm. the, um, the belief in it's going to be better, the willingness to experiment until something becomes a truth for, mm. for us. Is all, uh, this is where all these desires kind of support each other, don't that's they? That's right. And that's yeah. why we've got to discuss faith and yes. humility as a part of Later these yeah. tune with the conscience, yes. isn't it? Yeah. 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 All right. When I have a sincere desire for God's truth, I want to share truth with others. Yes. Now, this isn't sort of a, a feeling of, you need to know the truth and I need to tell you because I need to correct what you do. It's not yeah, that no. kind of a feeling. The, desire to, the true desire to share the truth with others re is really knowing the benefits of sharing it with, for them. Yeah. And so if I know the benefits inside of myself of, of the truth itself, because I've done my experiment, I've done mm -hmm. my you know, realisation of truth in the process inside of myself, now I can go and say, wow, God shared this with me through my conscience. This is what I want to share with you because it's going to benefit you. Trust me, it's going to yeah. it's going to work out good for you if you share it. And you desire to share it even when everyone around you feels they would rather not hear it. Yeah. Now, the reason why you do that is because you can see the benefits of it mm -hmm. and you don't care about whether you get attacked or not. Yeah. So in other yeah. words, it's a very selfless act. It's not it's not about it's not a selfish act. Mm -hmm. See, many people when they desire to share truth are doing it selfishly yes they just want the other person to change yes. in some way that benefits them you know the person giving the truth mm -hmm. in this case what we're doing it is unselfishly we're sharing the truth not because it benefits us because it doesn't we already know it yeah it, it already has benefited us yes we already know it there's no need for somebody to do something about it in order for us to feel better because we already feel better yeah <laughs> We're sharing it because of an act of love, mm -hmm. because it feels loving to be able to benefit the lives of others. Mm. And that's why we do it. Yeah. Now, a person, person who has that kind of attitude to truth is also going to be in tune with their conscience because they're not resisting doing something about the truth they hear yeah. or have learned. Yeah. They act upon it. Yes, yes.
And it's interesting you said um, you're not doing it to make yourself feel better. You already feel better. A lot of um, a lot of us feel like, oh, I hear the truth and I feel worse, which is indicating, isn't it, that that sincere desire is not there yet. Correct. Or we're not willing to be um, kind of humble to what the the truth is exposing within us. Exactly. We're not prepared to feel the emotions, which yep. is all about humility. Yep. Here we're talking about you still humble. We'll talk about that next. It's yeah, a yeah. very important quality. But here we're saying, right, assuming that we're humble, what we will do is we'll get into the state where we love the truth so much yeah. and we see its benefit. We've yes. experienced its benefit. We're already happy because of it. Yes. Now we're in a position to be able to share it with others. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now the sharing is not a demand. It's mm -hmm. not an expectation mm -hmm. on the other person to believe. Mm. It's just, here's something if you want to. It's really good. It's going to help you, but it's up to you whether you receive it or not. You know, that's yeah, yeah. the attitude we have. Which is really God's attitude to e us. Exactly. The operation of the conscience. Exactly. Yeah. It's, a, it's a mirror of God's way that God uses God's truth in the functioning of the conscience. Yeah. So all we're doing is basically becoming a physical conscience, <laughs> if you could say that, for other people. Yeah. And without any desire for anything in return, without any desire for any feedback and the willingness to do it, even though other people may disagree with us or attack us even yes. for it. Yes. Mm. And I see that in you all the time. Yeah. 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 And it's probably leads us to our sort of final point on this, um, which is when I'm really sincerely desiring God's truth, uh, I I want to see the truth about and sincerely correct the reasons why my behaviour is unloving mm -hmm. or to share the truth with people, mm -hmm. um, even if this means I'm going to feel some painful emotions or people around me don't understand me anymore. That's right. It's not, it's not something where we're going... When we receive God's truth and we act upon it and we benefited from it, we're in a state now where we're firmly convinced it is truth. Mm. Because we're firmly convinced it's truth and we've felt its benefits, we don't need it. We don't need to share it with others. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, like something we need in order to have them to go, oh, yeah, you're right, or yeah, anything like yeah. that. It's nothing like that. You don't have to share it with others. It's not a demand that you have on others that they listen to it even mm -hmm. or that they respond to it. But you are willing to see internally that you have things to do with it. Yeah. And there's some of these truths that you're going to receive where God's saying to you, look, mate, you're out of line here. <laughs> yeah. Or look, girl, you're, you're doing something wrong here. Yeah. And this is not going to be good for you or for others yeah what are you going to do about it type of thing and and most of us in that state will just go oh nothing because because yeah. we want whatever we're getting from doing those things but a person who's really open to truth goes no there's never an option to hear a truth and then do nothing about it mm. internally mm. no there's never an option because i know if i take that option i'm going to hurt myself mm. Truth helps me, mm -hmm. right? So whatever the truth is that I need to receive and do something about is always going to help me, yeah. whether it's external, relating to physical things, relating to spiritual things, relating to emotional things. It's always going to help me. What I need to do is be open enough and take the decision, make the decision mm -hmm. to make it benefit me through some actions where I've got to adjust my way of life as a result yeah. of it that have received it. So really, you're, you're really describing um, changing our attitude, our relationship with truth. That's going to help us with this sincere desire, isn't it? If yeah. we no longer see truth as an enemy, if we see truth as something that is, is beneficial, and we can use the evidence in our life around us to actually reflect and help to build some of that, um, you know, aspiration to understand that, yeah. that's going to help us to strengthen this desire for truth and it is this strong and sincere desire for truth that's going to help us to be sensitive to and to obey the operation of the conscience. Yes, it's, if we think about it, it's like it, it, there's examples we could perhaps give here where, you know, like if somebody, if, if I've discovered a new aspect of physics, yep. a new law that nobody knew, 
that is undoubtedly going to be able to help humanity in some way in the future. Yeah. Now, of course, it depends on how humanity uses that knowledge because yes. they could use it like they use a knife. Yeah. They could either use it to you know, cut some fruit up and eat or they can use it to destroy somebody. But mm -hmm. that, that's really up to humanity's decision now as to what they do with that knowledge. But the discovery of new knowledge always benefits humanity. Mm. The same applies in my personal life. Mm -hmm. Like if, I dis if I'm in a relationship and I discover my partner's cheating on me, that's just as beneficial. Yeah. Because now I know that my partner's not that connected to me sexually. My partner obviously has emotional issues with me and maybe I have with them and maybe I've been living in this illusion, you know, that our relationship is really good when it's not as good for my partner as I believe it is and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. And this helps me confront those issues. If I didn't know, I may be less inclined to confront them. Yeah. So even if it's a personal issue like that, or a universal issue like the first, you know, mm -hmm. the physical, the physics issue, it's benefiting me mm -hmm. and benefiting humanity. Mm. And it's always going to be the case. And unless I really love truth like that, and I understand it's always going to benefit, no matter what, I'm not going to have the right attitude to be able to hear God expressing truth. Yeah. through my conscience. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, summarize this section and mm -hmm. then I'll just ask you a follow-up question about, mm -hmm. about this. Um, <laughs> so basically when I sincerely want God's truth, I'm going to automatically desire God's truth. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a constant automatic state for me and it's going to make it much easier for God to share truth with me via the conscience mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we've described what that sincere desire actually looks like, mm. you know, so we mm. can't kid ourselves as to what that desire is. Mm. Of course, it's not an exhaustive description, <laughs> but hopefully it's given our listeners enough to understand what it means to have a sincere desire or longing for God's truth. Yeah. Yeah. So today we're talking about, and so far we've talked about the desire to love others and the desire um, for truth, to receive truth and act upon truth. And we're going to speak about aspects of humility and faith coming up. So this begs a question, um, if all of that is sort of, all of those desires are going to help me hear the conscience, aren't they all the same desires I need to have in order to receive God's love? So is that the question? Because it didn't uh, sound like it was It's a two-part question. <laughs> okay. Uh, is, so... Um, so aren't they, number one, aren't they all the same desires to receive God's love? Yes. Yep. And if they are, why did God create the conscience? Uh, do I not receive or become open to God's truth when I receive God's love? <laughs> that just turned into a three-parter. <laughs> 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 can you, you remember all the parts? Oh, I can. <laughs> oh, I can. Would you like me to take you back through them? No, we'll do one at a time. I yeah, think, for, our, I mean. for our listeners. I'll for, rewind and I'll benefit, say it yeah. from, from the beginning. <laughs> so the desires that we're discussing today, we've got six that we've talked about. There's faith that we're going to talk about. Uh, truth, love, faith, humility, and I can't remember the other two. Morality and ethics. Morality and ethics, yes. All essential are these all essential desires? Are these desires the ones that uh, enable me to receive God's love once I... Yes. You can't receive God's love unless you know the truth that God's love is available. That's right. So the reality is you can't receive God's love unless truth was already pre-existing. Mm -hmm. Now, the way God allowed truth to pre-exist was via the conscience, mm -hmm. a mechanism that he inbuilt into each person's soul. And that pre-existing condition, that a connection with God that allows for truth to be disseminated by God to humans, allows God to say, my love's available. If God never said, my love's available, no one would ever know. Mm -hmm. And if no one ever knew, you can't long for something you don't know anything about. Mm. So we'd never long for God's love. 
So even though in these two um, uh, sections we've just spoken about relating to love and truth, we've referenced the desire for God's love um, and the desire for God's truth, you're basically saying that even if we had no knowledge that God's love and God's truth existed, just the desire to love others and the desire to know truth would automatically help us to become more open to the conscience, which could then convey... Well, no, I feel we need to stop confusing matters for our audience, babe. Okay. The questions were how to become more sensitive to the conscience yep. and how to obey it. They are the, what these questions surround. Yep. Every person, as a result of their very creation, is already sensitive to their conscience. Uh -huh. So at the moment of their conception, they are the most sensitive yeah. to their conscience. They're already sensitive. Yeah. Now, it's just not an aware sen awareness of the sensitivity. Mm. To become aware of the sensitivity, we have to be educated. Right? And to become aware that we can obey, we have to also have a desire to use our will. To use our will, we must have a knowledge that we have the ability to use our will and therefore some life experience. Mm -hmm. So, so I feel the questions are not linking in those factors. We need to see, firstly, that we are beings of free will, that when we incarnate for the first time, we are undeveloped. We don't know how to use that will. But we do have a conscience mechanism that is extremely sensitive right at the moment of our conception. Yep. And beforehand is in, in our creation, but we're not aware of how to use it. We're just, it's there, it exists, mm -hmm. and God's automatically telling us truth. But it's the truth that we can cope with at the time mm -hmm. to be able to determine things about. Now, obviously, a baby who's still being breastfed and, and you know, is three or four months old is not able to act upon truth very much at all, <laughs> even though it has a sensitively aware conscience. Yes. Right? It also doesn't know what questions to ask. It has had no life experience. It doesn't know what to do with, it, with itself. It doesn't know how to act upon, and it has not yet the physical development to act upon any of the truth or much of the truth it receives. So, so naturally, while it's very, very sensitive, it really can't obey <laughs> very much at all at this stage. Obedience is only going to come through development. In other words, doing something about it is going to apply through development. Yep. Now, if we are examining the issue of love, the baby is able to be loved and able to feel the feeling of love, even though it's not aware of what the feeling feels like, because it hasn't had the life experience yet to know what it feels like. It's a natural state of the soul that it can feel, it, it feels better. Yes. It feels happier. It feels more joyful. But if you asked a four month old baby with an undeveloped intellect, do you realize that's what love that you're getting? They wouldn't be able to answer you because they don't even have the language to do so. So you're drawing a relationship between the intellectual development and the physical development of an individual with their... No, I'm talking about their emotional development. Okay. The baby at four months old is emotionally undeveloped. It also has an undeveloped will. Mm. And therefore, it's unable to understand what it's receiving, even though it likes what it's receiving. <laughs> All right? Yeah. So it can still feel joy about what it's receiving, even though it's not aware of what it's receiving. And it can still feel pain about negative things it's receiving mm -hmm. the damaged emotions of its parents it's also receiving and it feels pain about that that's why it cries mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't know that the reason why it feels pain it just feels pain and it feels it yeah uh, that's an undeveloped being an undeveloped person here we're talking about a person who's now fully grown yes in our context here yes a person now who's fully grown and now wants to know how to get back that sensitivity <laughs> that they had as a child. Yes. And also get back the sensitivity, the, uh, develop the desire to act upon. 
-hmm. in other words to obey the conscience yeah and that's in context what we're discussing here yes so then as the developed individual that I don't think I am, but you know, in this context. Well, no, let's say every adult. Every adult. Whether developed or not in their conscience, every adult has, has to do something if they want to gain back some sensitivity, the childlike sensitivity mm -hmm. that we used to have to the conscience. Yes. Right, which a child naturally has been created in the state. You could say a child incarnates in its first instance in the sixth fear condition and perfect natural love and then slowly degrades over time due to its environment, right? Yes, yeah, so we want to regain that sensitivity. Of course. Yes. Once we've gained the sensitivity, we also now want to use our will yeah. to obey. Yes. Now, a child can't do that so much because it lacks development to obey. Yes. yes. As it develops in its experience of life, becomes three, four, five, six years old instead of a few months old, mm -hmm. now it has the ability to obey its conscience. It has the ability to follow through on what mm -hmm. God's sharing via the conscience. Good. Mm. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, my question really related to um, the, like, does the conscience become redundant once I receive God's love? No, never. The conscience is never redundant. Because you can receive God's love, but still not know truth. Mm -hmm. God has to have a mechanism of sharing truth with you. Love is an emotion. Truth is information, emotional information. Emotionally conveyed, but yet it is information. Yeah, and yeah. it's information in harmony with love. In other yeah. words, God's truth is always in harmony with God's love mm -hmm. in that it, it has emotional connotations yes. and it also is loving in the way that it would need to be shared. Uh -huh. But but it's different to love itself. Truth is just facts. Yes. Facts that don't necessarily have a an emotional signature to them, mm -hmm. although they will all have the signature of love in them. Yes. Love is a specific emotion that we receive, mm -hmm. which is and can be independent of any facts. Yes. Uh, now, love does make us more open to receiving new facts, uh -huh. but truth makes us open to receiving more love. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that there is a correlation. And we've always said this to everyone, that there is a correlation between the two, mm -hmm. a correlation between truth and love. But obviously, the truth must come first. Because unless the truth comes first, yes. we don't know how to receive love, mm -hmm. particularly love that we need to desire, mm. a, a personal relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's very different than a general love, you know, the general love that God has for all humanity. Mm -hmm. All of us can feel that at any time. That's very different than a personal love. So then um, the original part of my question was th these desires for all of these qualities, personal qualities that we're talking about today, um, don't they also, aren't they also what's needed in order to receive God's love? No, mm. they're not needed to receive God's love in the first instance. Mm -hmm. They are needed to receive God's love after a while. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond, uh, to continually receive love. To continually receive mm -hmm. God's love, you have to bring yourself into more harmony with the love you've already received. received. Gotcha. Right? So, so no, in the first instance, you can receive love without anything other than truth. Yes. Now the truth, and of course, humility. Yes. Right? You need those two qualities, which we've already always talked about. Yeah. And perhaps faith is another that you do need in the sense that, you know, you need to have faith that it's going to be received. Yeah. But, but love is an emotion which is very different in its qualities to truth, which are facts. Yes. And here we're talking about the ability to receive facts yeah. that don't necessarily have emotional connotations. Yes. And may not have any emotional connotation to if, if we don't have a pre-existing emotional condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love is different, though. Love is always going to have an emotional effect on us. Yeah. So they're completely different substances even that God's transmitting. One is the substance of love, which is an emotion. Other is the substance of fact, information. Yep. yep. Two completely different things. Yes. That are being received. They're linked with each other. 
that love can't come first. Truth has to come first. Then love will come and then the love will open us up to receiving more truth. And so when we receive more truth after we've received God's love, is that truth coming to us via the conscience? Well, uh, the love, what the love does is it predisposes the soul to understand things that it couldn't understand before when it did not have the love. Yeah. So it makes the soul grow in its capacity, but it's only a potential capacity. In other words, the soul has grown to have a new capacity of mm -hmm. being able to assimilate more truth because it's now in harmony with more love. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that it will automatically assimilate that truth. Yeah. That's it. To assimilate the truth, it's first got to hear it. Mm -hmm. Then it's got to go through the process we've already described. It's got to hear it. It's got to desire it, mm -hmm. hear it, mm -hmm. experiment with it, act upon it. Yep have the results of the experiment yes. confirmed and then the truth is known. Mm. And that will always be the case no matter how much love we've received. Yeah. Now, this is very clearly defined in the Paget messages, in a Paget message that we've gone through already, which is one from John, where he talked about how to determine truth yes. and the methods that I've used myself in determining truth all of my life. Mm -hmm. And this is the exact description of that method. Yeah. The method of determining truth is a process of first hearing it or first even having a dream of it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then hearing it, yeah. then acknowledging that there might be something in it, taking some action upon it, experimenting with it, solidifying it. It becomes reality because you now do it and mm -hmm. you know it to be true. It's mm -hmm. now firm. It's now within you as a, as a firm truth. That process is independent of receiving God's love. But God's love does allow the soul to understand new things that it couldn't understand before. And therefore, God's love predisposes the soul to go through that process with new and more complex truths. Mm. So it sort of broadens your um, capacity for understanding potentials, but then truth must still be discovered yes. and experienced for an individual to have it within them. That's right. And presumably the same thing occurs with the transmission of truth via the conscience. Of course. It's not within That's us. That's the way yes. we hear it initially. Yep. And in fact, that's the way I've always heard it, um, only through that method. The conscience. The conscience. Mm -hmm. And then now we've got to decide, what are we going to do? <laughs> are you going to experiment with it or are yeah. you just going to ignore yeah. it? Now, yeah. there's been times when I've ignored it for many, many years. Yes. And then I've experimented and then I've found it to be true. Yeah. And once I've found it to be true, now it's a solidified truth within you. Yeah. The ability to understand it at its most complex levels requires God's love. Mm hmm this is why the transformation above the sixth sphere is so important. Yeah. But the process is the same whether we're in the hells or in the celestial heavens when it comes to truth. Mm -hmm. We receive truth the same way, yes. always the same way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Love can open our heart to receive more complex truths. Yeah. But it's only a potential. It's not reality until we actually do it through the mechanism of the conscience and then acting upon that and making decisions based upon our will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the only way it can happen. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you for going down that rabbit hole with me. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I'm sure, you know, there's still what I find is most people still have a bit of misunderstanding about all these things Yes. Um, in the sense of what does the love do and what does the truth do and so forth. And most people also think that once the love is received, that it automatically means that there's all this new truth available. Well, it automatically means that we're capable of understanding yeah. the new truths that are available. Mm -hmm. But our willingness to listen to our conscience is going to depend. Mm -hmm. It's going to determine whether those things that are available become reality. Yeah. 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 All right. And that's why the mechanism of the conscience is so important to understand. Without it, we could receive a lot of love and still not enjoy the benefits of more truth. Of more truth. Yep. Yes. And also, I think another thing you've just highlighted in that discussion is that 
these desires uh, that we're just talking about today enable us to become more sensitive to the operation of the conscience, which will in turn open us up to being more open to the reception of God's love. Yes, and, and that certainly does help. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, God's love is the thing that transforms the soul into a new creature. Yes. And it's the new creature who is capable of understanding new truths, but only through the operation of its conscience the same way as it always has. So it sort of uh, <laughs> builds upon itself. Yes, so yep. you, you say that love, like I've said, the love transforms the soul to such an extent that now the soul is capable of understanding the highly complex truths that God mm -hmm. has to offer. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean the soul will understand them unless the soul engages the truth process, which, which is... is listening to what God's got to share about say, a subject, getting to understand it, putting it into practice, mm -hmm. taking, putting it into application, making it a reality for oneself. Mm -hmm. That process is a process that will always continue to occur as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that process to a degree is independent of the love received. Mm -hmm. Although the love received does determine the capability of understanding, yes. the potential of understanding. So an individual who hasn't received God's love, the capacity of the conscience to share things with them is limited. To the six fear truths. Yes. That's it. An individual who's begun to receive God's love, there's far more capacity for the conscience to convey different truths. Yes, receiving God's love, remember, you know, God's love is an infinite, has an infinite quality to it, mm -hmm. which means that once we've received it, we now can begin to understand an infinite number of truths. Mm -hmm. Whereas a person in the sixth dimension of the spirit world who has not received God's love mm -hmm. is now limited by the soul's limitation, mm -hmm. the natural soul's limitation, is limited to how much truth can be shared. And that limit is the sixth dimension of yeah. the spirit world. Yeah. And that's the limit of the extent of the truth that you can receive via the conscience unless you receive God's love. Mm. If you receive God's love, you now have an unlimited capacity to understand more and more and more and more and more, just dependent upon how much of that love you've received. Yeah. So naturally they are working in a harmonious way together, these mm -hmm. two functions of the soul, the desire to receive love and the desire to receive truth have obviously a, ha, ha, are to a degree related with each other, but the discovery and application of new truth is independent to a degree mm -hmm. from the process of receiving more love. Yes, yeah. No, I, thank you for clarifying all of that. I think because we talk about the Holy Spirit um, and it, its uh, spirit of truth, mm -hmm. And we talk about that being the conduit for God's love. Yes. And then we talk about the conscience conveying truth from God. Um, I just thought there's the capacity for confusion. And yes, well, if we, if we even talk about the Holy Spirit a bit, the yeah. Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. In other words, it responds to the truthful, sincere longing of the heart. Yes. It will not respond unless the heart has a truthful, sincere longing. Mm -hmm. But the heart doesn't have to know the truth to, yes. re to respond. Yes. Right? The to heart has to get into a condition yeah. where it has that truthful, sincere longing. Yeah. The spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, responds to that truthful, sincere longing for love specifically. Yes. That's what it responds to. Yeah. The conscience is not like that. Yeah. The conscience responds to truth all the time. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and we can only desensitize ourselves to it and disobey it. Yeah. That's how we detune from it. Yes. But it's a mechanism that's there from the beginning of our creation of our soul. Yeah. And, and it's a, uh, it, it remains within us our entire existence as so far known. Mm -hmm. With regard to the love, the potential of receiving it is built into the soul. Mm -hmm. But it is activated by a longing. Mm -hmm. With regard to the conscience, it's not needing activation. Mm. It is already in operation. 
all we can do is detune from it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. It's an autom- It's a. It's an inbuilt feature. <laughs> yes. So, sorry, yeah. go ahead. So it's very important that people understand the difference between the two functions. Yes. One is the function that allows God's love to flow. Mm-hmm. The other is the function that allows God's truth to flow. Yes. The function that allows God's truth to flow is inbuilt and unable to be prevented except via decision-making available in the soul. Yes. Right? The, the function of love being received is only able to be developed through a longing that's in harmony with sincerity, within harmony with truth. In harmony with truth. And that sincere longing, because you've talked about that as a longing for truth, but a really intrinsic in a humble, sincere longing is a willingness to reassess truth, isn't it? It's not necessarily the... Not always, you know, you can be desirous of love. Yep. And at the same time, resistive to specific truths. Yes. And there, and this is the why why we don't receive love consistently. Yeah. Because we're not we're not humble to truth. Yes. We we are often desire the love, mm-hmm. right? And and sometimes have a sincere desire for love. And then in those moments that we have a sincere desire for love, we will receive it. But truth affects our sincerity. Yes. And unless we share, something is shared with us about our lack of sincerity and the reasons why we are not being sincere, mm-hmm. then it's highly unlikely we'll receive more truth. Yeah. More love, sorry. Yes. We're hi- highly unlikely we'll have a sincere longing for more. Yeah. Unless we get to go, ah, oh, the truth is that I'm resisting this or the truth is that I don't, you know, the truth is I'm treating this person badly. That's why I'm not receiving more. Got you. Yeah. All right. So they do work hand in hand together, but it's important for everyone to understand that the conscience mechanism is the key to it all, yeah. because without the conscience mechanism, we wouldn't know. Like I would never in the first century have discovered without the conscience mechanism, yeah. I would never have discovered that God's truth was available, that God's love, sorry, was available. Mm. And therefore I would never have longed for it. Yeah. And therefore never have received it. Yeah even though it was available. Yeah. So it's very important to see that the mechanism of the conscience allows for God to share truth no matter what our condition of love is. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So in that way, they're very different from each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Desire for humility affects sensitivity and obedience to conscience. <laughs> so... How will a desire for humility to experience my emotion affect my sensitivity to my conscience? Well, firstly, we've learnt so far in all of the discussions that everybody's heard from from us that humility is the desire to feel all of your emotions, whether they're painful or pleasurable. Mm -hmm. So firstly, we need to bear that in mind about humility. And humility, but humility also has this other aspect, which I'd like to probably raise with people now. And that is this aspect. We've talked about this aspect in the discussions about humility that we've had. You remember the Q&As we did about humility some time ago? I think it was 2013 or 12 yep, or something. Yep, the good around series. That. We, we talked about a lot of the qualities of humility there. But, yep. and, and some of the th- these things now that we're mentioning, we'll, we mentioned there. Humility really involves removing from ourselves a worth-based connection between our personal opinions and our beliefs Mm. and and the feeling that we're worth something. In other words, we've got to divorce our sense of knowledge about ourselves and the universe around us from our worth. Mm. And we've got to see that we're worth something, even if we know nothing. Yes. Right. Or even if everything we know is wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, a person who's truly humble will be able to go, okay, there's a potential that everything I know is wrong. There's a potential that everything that I've seen, you know, everything that I think I know, every belief, opinion that I have is wrong. There is this, there is that potential. Now, obviously, as you receive more and more of God's truth and act upon it and make it a firm part of your soul, there's less of a potential of that being true. But initially, 
particularly for a child or a baby, uh, one, particularly one who's just born or, uh, you know, still in the womb, they don't know any truth really mm. at this stage or very little truth. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly no cognizant knowledge, uh, will, if self-aware based knowledge of truth yeah. in that state. So, so we need to see that humility is the ability to feel and experience all of one's emotions, whether painful or pleasurable. Now, a baby is in that state. Mm. So that, that is the state of the child. But then there's this second aspect to humility, which a child is automatically in by nature, but not by choice. Mm. And that is, it absorbs new information without any concern about that new information triggering its worth. The reason why is because it doesn't have a concept of its own worth. And yeah. so it's naturally in that state. Yeah. But as adults, we're not naturally in that state. Yeah. What happens is over time, over our lifetime, we gather information and this information becomes very strongly held belief systems and very strongly held emotions that say, because I know this information, I'm worth something. Yeah. And that's our problem. Yeah. when it comes to humility. Now, a person who's truly humble is in the state of the child by choice, mm. not, not just by design, yeah. but by choice. Yeah. They choose to remain in the state of the child. In other words, remain in the state where they're willing to be flexible with all of their belief systems and opinions. Mm. And they certainly don't have an attachment between their worth and their belief systems. Mm. So we need to make sure that everyone understands that at the yeah. beginning of this discussion. So now the question becomes, how does that kind of humility help yes. me with regard to the connection with my conscience? Mm -hmm. And I think if once we know that that's what humility really is, it's yeah. quite obvious how it helps me. Yes. Because now I can start to see that, wow, I am going to be willing to absorb new information anytime. Mm. because I am willing to experiment with it any time. Yeah. I'm willing to look at it, examine it, put it you know, into some kind of practice to see whether it's true any time, yeah. because I'm no longer addicted to the concept that if I have to give up what I think I know, then I'm not worth anything anymore. Yeah. Right. yeah. So that's going to have a very large effect on my ability to connect to my conscience. Yes. Yes, and con yes. Conversely, if I'm always wanting to, God's, the conscience is trying to convey to me truth, but I'm I feel like oh, I can't hear that because that means I'm a bad person or I've done something wrong or what's my life really been about or I want to fight and argue with what I'm going to hear. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm not going to hear very much, am I? Because it's if a you think soul about it, All of those things you just said are very common. Yes. Day, it's like, yes. man, it's like how we, we confront those things on a daily basis yes. in people. Yes. You know, almost everything we say, there's an argument about somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you can see that it is very common for people on earth and in the spirit world mm -hmm. to argue about everything. And the question becomes, why are we arguing about everything? Yeah. And that's not about the truth at all. Mm -hmm. That's about our worth and how our worth is connected to the concept of knowing, knowing or knowledge. Yes. And that is a problem that mm -hmm. we need to give up if we're going to be humble. Yeah. If we give it up, now we can respond and hear our conscience very easily. Yeah. And God's, God will be able to share a new truth and we go, wow, there's a new truth. What am, what am <laughs> I going to do? Well, yeah. because I'm in this state where I'm no longer addicted to maintaining my current set of beliefs about myself or about mm -hmm. the world around me, I'm going to experiment with it yeah. automatically. Automatically. I'm not going to resist it. I'm not going to argue with it, not going to fight it. I'm not going to prevent it for as long as possible mm. and all of those other things that the average person does. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. So um, let's talk about uh, what it kind of looks like when I'm humble. Sure. <laughs> so um, when I'm humble, I desire to feel, experience and release all of my emotional responses to God's truth. Mm. So some of that's going to be happy and some of it's going to be painful or resistive, or, but I'll, I'll feel all of that. That's right. So a humble person, as we've said, is like a child with regard to the experience of emotion. 
So that means that if I'm humble, I will just go ahead and feel my emotions about mm-hmm. things. Now, some of my emotions about receiving God's truth and are going to be really, really happy. Like, it's going to be fantastic to hear that you're doing certain things a certain way. And it's going to be ha- happy that you're going to be happy to hear that certain things that you can see will benefit you. When you see they'll benefit you, well, you're going to be very happy about that. But other things, when it talks about, oh, now your truth about your relationships being confronted or the truth about yourself, your own image of yourself, you know, the person you think you are when Mm. you look in the mirror compared to what God sees you as, those things will be confronted too. And if I'm humble, I'll choose to experience that too. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's what a humble person does. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, When I'm humble, I no longer desire to fight against God's truth. Yeah, so fighting truth is a very big problem. Truth, the reason why it's such a big problem is that truth always benefits us. Mm. So when we fight it, we're always, yeah. always going to be disadvantaged, disadvantaged by yeah. it. So it's a terrible thing to be in this habit of fighting truth, no matter what the truth is, whether it's personal or universal. It's a terrible thing to continue fighting it. A person who needs to argue all the time and be argumentative all the time has a major problem with this. Mm-hmm. And, and we see so many of these people that we meet on a daily basis, you know, in all forms of religions and in all places of society where, you know, they just want to fight and argue about everything you're saying. I don't need to argue about it. Yeah. If you need to argue about it, you've got a problem with fighting truth and you, yeah. and you need to address it. Otherwise, you're going to struggle receiving any information via the conscience. Mm. 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 Okay, when I'm humble, I desire to remove from myself all the emotional responses inside of me that indicate I'm fighting against God's truth. Yeah, so this is a, more of an extension of the previous mm-hmm. thought. And this thought is basically along the lines like this. If I'm fighting, I can see that I'm disadvantaging myself. Yeah. So it would be in my best interest to find out why I'm fighting. Mm -hmm. And that's about emotions that exist in me where I have connections between receiving truth and my belief systems. I I want to hold on to my belief systems because I have some worth associated with those belief systems. I believe they make me worthy. They make me a a more clever individual or or a more potent (laughs) human being or whatever it is that I believe about myself holding on to these beliefs. Now, I need, if I am in truly humble, I would go, wow, I'm fighting. Mm-hmm. So oh, fighting is always going to be a disadvantage. So fighting is not an option here. Mm. So what do I need to do instead? What I need to do is let myself feel about why I'm fighting. Yeah. And I'll be open to working my th- way through that if I'm truly humble. Why am I fighting? Get rid of the reasons why I'm fighting. Yeah because that's going to help me be more sensitive to my conscience. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. Okay. When I'm humble, I desire to no longer maintain my own belief systems and self-belief when God's truth is indicating to me that such belief systems are false. Yes. So here, remember, the conscience is God's uh, is a mechanism that's inbuilt in the soul that allows God to tell me the facts about me. Mm and also about the world around me. Now, most people, when it talks about the facts about the world around them, most people are more open, but not all, because if a person already believes they know those facts, yes, they're not going to be open. Mm-hmm. So sometimes scientists, for example, can be more closed to certain facts yeah, because they already believe they know things that they don't know. Yes. And, and, and as a result of that, they can be resistive because they have a link between their worth and what they believe. Mm -hmm. Now, we personally, but and this is everybody, generally does this on a personal scale. So when it comes to personal truth, most of us have an image of ourselves inside of our head and inside of our emotional state, our facade-based emotional state, our addictions, that tells us, no, I'm like this, I'm like this. Don't you tell me that I'm not like this. Yes. I am like this. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And God's trying to share truth on everything, which mm-hmm. includes sharing the truth about yourself. Mm-hmm. And if, if the truth about yourself is, no, I'm sorry, you're not like that. Yeah. Right. And in God's case, he's not even saying sorry. Because yeah. <laughs> he, he, he thinks it's a good thing yeah. <laughs> to let you know. <laughs> to let you know. <laughs> so he won't say, I'm sorry. He's going to say, no, you're not like that. Yeah. <laughs> There's 
And and when when somebody says that to us or so, somebody shares that kind of truth with us, the majority of us have a huge amount of problem with that. Mm -hmm. Now, the bigger the problem we have, the less capacity we have to be sensitive to our conscience. Yes. So that's uh, that's obviously going to be a bad thing for us in the long run. Yeah. 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 Excellent. All right. When I'm humble, I'm no longer addicted. Oh, I just said that one, didn't I? No, you no. said the previous. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no longer addicted to maintaining my belief systems and my beliefs about myself in order to maintain my own concept of worth in family and society. So here we're talking more about family and society. Yeah, and yeah. our own worth. So now this is an extension of our previous thing where we're talking yes. about just the attitudes I have about my own belief systems. Mm -hmm. Here we're saying we're more talking about our addictions. So mm -hmm. previously we're talking more about our beliefs. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about our addictions. Now addictions are firmly held emotions that demand satisfaction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, most of us have firmly held emotions that demand satisfaction in relationship to society. In other words, our relation to yes. society in relationship to family. In other yeah. words, our own relationship with family mm -hmm. and in relationship to our own self concept. Yes. Our beliefs about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we have firmly held addictions that are emotionally based that demand satisfaction. Yeah. Now, these kind of addictions that demand satisfaction have a terrible uh, toll, play a, you know, uh, put a terrible toll on our conscience. Yeah. Because we're unable to hear our conscience whenever one of these addictions demands satisfaction. Yeah. Our emotional addictions are going to yell louder mm -hmm. than our conscience. Mm -hmm. Our conscience doesn't yell. It's a soul based function where God is just sharing facts. Yes. It doesn't yell at us. Yeah. It can only share truth. Our addictions yell at us yeah. emotionally. They demand things of us. Yes. They want satisfaction. They're going to be louder. Now, unless I'm willing to re get rid of them mm -hmm. and reduce them somehow, yeah. right, they are going to swamp out yeah. any con truth that comes via the conscience. Yeah. So that is a major problem. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, I was just reminded then of something you said uh, once a while back about being soft to the next um, quiet whisper, was it? Or yeah. The, yeah, yeah, being soft. Yeah, to God, you things. could say God's voice is like a quiet whisper. It's a yeah. whisper. It's, a, it's, it's not a, 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 it's a. It's a. It's very like I find it very strong, strong in feelings, but yeah. because it, it, the more sensitive you become in your soul, the stronger mm -hmm. it becomes. But but you know, the more addictions you have in those particular areas where you have addictions, yeah. you're not going to hear. No, you you won't hear for long periods of yeah. time. The secret is to get rid of the addictions. Then you have the capacity to hear. Yeah. Yeah. But but while we have the addictions, it's almost like we have to listen for a whisper because it's so drowned out by the... the yeah, I feel that while you have the addictions, you won't even hear the whisper. Yeah. You won't even hear it. And you won't even desire to listen to it, actually. Yeah. The addictions demand satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, yeah. they are going to be what dominates you. Yeah. And unless you're willing, which is an aspect of humility, being willing to let go of them to mm -hmm. to work your way through them because they're all emotional yeah unless you're willing to do that you, you you're going to find that you can't even hear your conscience yes you can't even you don't even won't even know it's there yeah <laughs> <laughs> because your conscience doesn't scream at you like your addictions no. do <laughs> yes. it's, a, it's a bit like saying there's two people in a room with you mm -hmm. one of them's going this is what i'm saying to you and the other's going <laughs> <laughs> and yelling and screaming yeah, at you. Yeah, Sorry yeah. about the sound there. Yeah. <laughs> Which one are you going to be yeah. <laughs> noticing the most? <laughs> Ooh, I'll be backing out of that room. <laughs> you can see that the one who's who's just a, even a normal volume, you won't even know they're yeah. there probably. Yeah. yeah. And that's what it's like with your addictions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> uh, when I'm humble... I will want to see the truth about and sincerely correct the reasons why my behavior is in unloving. Even if this means feeling painful emotions or means that people in my environment no longer understand me. Yes. Yeah, so before we were talking about truth, about this sort yes. of same topic, about the desire to see truth in order to, yeah. this is saying, well, 
you're not going to want to see the truth, yeah. <laughs> really, uh, unless you, uh, you know, if you have a hum humble state, yes. now you want to see the truth. Yes. Right. Because you know the benefits of truth. Mm -hmm. So that's about the truth discussion. You know the benefits of truth. Now you're in a humble state. You can say, OK, I'm willing to receive this truth. I want to receive it. Mm -hmm. And I also want to see every time I'm out of harmony with it, every time my emotions are trying to resist it, if I can get rid of those emotions, now I'm in a much better state where I can receive more of the truth from God. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, a, it's a good thing. Yeah. OK. When I'm humble, I use logical reasoning to support what God is telling me via my conscience mm -hmm. rather than using false intellectual reasoning to discount the truth. So mm. talk to us about why <laughs> we are discussing reasoning when, as an aspect of humility. Isn't humility just about feeling emotion? Humility drives our ability to logically reason. Mm. If we lack humility, we have a very low ability to logically reason. Mm -hmm. What we do instead is we, we develop logic, which we think is logic, but it's not. So let's call it logic in quotations. Yeah. We develop our form of logic, mm -hmm. which is really just about supporting our addictions and our emotional and beliefs and opinions. Yeah. That's all it's about. Mm -hmm. So when God shares an opinion like love is a good thing, yeah. to a person who believes in their heart through emotional conditioning that love is a bad thing, yeah. the person in their heart who believes that love is a bad thing will start reasoning along the lines of, no, love isn't a good thing. Love has done this to me. It's hurt me. It's damaged me. The person cheated on me and made me feel terrible about myself. Blah, 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 blah. And we list 25 different reasons why we think love is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That's a sign of a lack of humility. Yeah. A person who has humility will go, hang on a sec. God's truth is that love's a good thing. Mm -hmm. All of my feelings that love is a bad thing are my feelings. Mm -hmm. And they've got something to do with pain that I've not released from my past and belief systems that are in me that are false. Mm -hmm. That's all they're about. Right. I need to get rid of them. And I'll see that love is a good thing. Yeah. Right. Now, a person is capable of this kind of logical reasoning, even when they believe love is a bad thing inside mm -hmm. of them. They are capable of it. But you have to be humble to do it. When we're not humble, what we do instead is we argue for our current state. So what that means is we present a fight at a series of arguments yep. that support or we think support our current state of belief systems. Yeah. Right. So we're not interested anymore in listening to God's belief systems. <laughs> we're only interested in hearing support for our own belief systems. Right. And so we're not going to seek to know what the conscience is saying anymore. We're going to seek from other people who have been damaged exactly the same way that we have saying, yes, what you believe is a good thing. Now, we see this in play all the time on the planet. Most of the wars in, in the planet are caused by society getting together and believing that their false belief systems are good. Yeah. Right? It's OK to go on a religious rampage. Yeah. It's OK to, you know, commit to war against a certain race. Mm -hmm. It's OK to do these particular things. And this is agree, agreed in society. And all of these agreements are a lack of logical reasoning, but they're based upon the hurt condition, the emo hurt emotional condition of the individual. And really, it's the lack of willingness, a lack of desire to be humble to the hurt emotional condition that almost generates an intellectually re intellectual reasoning state that will support the lack of feeling, doesn't it? You could say it generates an intellectual unreasoning state. Yes. Which is exactly what it does. It's yes. not logical. It is unreasonable. Because the soul's desire is, I don't want to feel about this. I don't so want to go through the pain. As the soul is like the source yes. of our reasoning or our intellectual thoughts, yeah. uh, then we start to have thoughts that support that soul-based state. That's right. Whereas conversely, if I'm humble, now I can think the the restriction on not feeling is not dictating my thought processes. That's right. When you're humble, you're able to logically see 
that your emotions yeah. are one thing yeah. and the truth is another thing. Yes. When you're not humble, you're not able to see that. Mm -hmm. You believe your emotions are the truth. Yeah. That's the problem. When you're not humble, by believing the emotions are the truth, now what are you going to do? You're going to support your emotions as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the emotions you're supporting are mostly very damaging. Mm -hmm. So naturally, the results are going to be damaging. Yeah. Right? If you're truly humble, you're able to reason a lot more logically and say, hang on a sec, I have all these feelings. These feelings tell me that if someone hurts me, it's okay for me to hurt them. That's mm. my feelings. They're not very logical, mm. right? And they're not in harmony what, with what my conscience is telling me. Yes. My conscience is telling me that it's pretty stupid, actually. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that kind of thinking is completely flawed because it's going to result in a huge amount of damage on the planet if mm -hmm. everybody imbibed it and everybody does. And that's why we've got such bad damage on the planet. And my logical reasoning now is able to divorce my feelings from the truth. Yeah. And it's able to say, no, even though I have these feelings and even though that was my experience in the past, it's not God's truth. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why I feel those things and I can get rid of those feelings without myself, you know, rejecting God's truth. So really just you're describing a state where I have the capacity to understand I have feelings that I don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but And that, that are painful. That are painful. And that I believe are true. <laughs> <laughs> and that I believe are true. I can see all of that and still intellectually reason even though I'm still unwilling to. So you're saying that's a humble state. And I just want to clarify that for our listeners, because usually we identify the humble state as feeling. So before you were saying your example was love is a bad thing. So I'm not yet willing to experience the emotional grief that mm -hmm. love is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Which is, a, which is the, a, ultimate. the true humble state that was going to help me in the end get rid of the feeling. Yes, it's like the ultimate expression of my humility. Correct. But there is a, a more humble state, is this what we're calling it, or a humble state? No, there's an in-between state of yes. humility, which is saying, while I have those feelings, I am not going to support them anymore with my reasoning. Yes. Because they are false. Yeah. God's you know, conscience mechanism, God's truth is telling me they're false. Mm -hmm. I can't support them anymore. I've got to stop supporting them. Yeah. I've got to stop, you know, using them as excuses yeah. to come up with reason, <laughs> yeah. which is false, yeah. that support them. It's like feeding the feeding the monster, the beast. I think I think of it. You know, I can choose to feed the the beast of my belief that love is a bad thing with all this false reasoning that I can. can I could write a page of of a list of why bad is, love is a bad thing. I'm sure most people could write a book on yes. why bad love is a bad thing <laughs> off the top of their head. You know, but but all of their statements would be false. Yes from yes. God's perspective. And and that would all just be feeding the state, of the blocked state, the lack of humility. Correct. It's sort yeah. of almost like a snowball in some ways, isn't yes. it? Yes. Because it, you first have been hurt. Yeah. Instead of releasing the hurt, you've stored it. Mm -hmm. This hurt now is painful because you're storing it. It, it. You know, when you're a child and you release hurt, it's no longer painful. You forget about it completely. But as you grow up more and more, you store more and more and more. It's now inside of you. This feeds belief systems you know, belief systems are constructed inside of you to support the fact that you're storing it. Yeah. And and now, you you know, this is a never ending process now. And you could, if you stay in this in this cycle, mm -hmm. you could stay without love, for example, if you believe that love's a bad thing, you could stay without love for thousands of years. Yeah. And that would be very, very sad. Mm -hmm. And also you, you, you wouldn't be happy that entire time. Yeah. So, you know, you could stay in that condition for a long period of time if you're not careful. Mm. What I'm suggesting is there's this intermediate sort of state of humility, which most people on the planet are not even there yet. Yeah. Which is, which is seeing that your emotions are... Emotions. Emotions and harmful yeah. to your reasoning ability, mm -hmm. but still being able to reason that, no, they're just emotions mm -hmm. and they're not the truth. Yeah. And God, the, if you can do that, you'll be able to listen to your conscience more. Yeah. The reason why most people can't hear their conscience at all is because they're unable to do that. Yeah. 
Uh, they're, yeah. they're caught in this cycle of feeding the state that they're in, which is, I can't feel emotion, I can't feel emotion. So all reasoning is born of that condition and therefore not all possibilities are yeah. up for grabs and logic is not Logic's real. gone out. Yeah. Yeah. True reasoning and logic has gone out of the window yeah. now. Yeah. And all we're doing now is using our unhealed emotional state to feed our thoughts mm. and, our, and to justify and then to use our thoughts to justify our unhealed emotional state. Yeah. And that's all we're doing. Yeah. And therefore justify our future yeah. actions. Yeah. And, and um, I was just reminded of your son, Tristan, for some reason, because what I notice in him is that when you engage logical reasoning with him, he's already so humble that it just automatically um, triggers the, the emotion that he's holding on to anyway, mm -hmm. because he's already in that state of, I can engage, I can engage with logic with the knowledge that I have some unhealed emotions and then as soon as the logic confronts his unhealed emotion there's a willingness to feel that and so that's another way it becomes cyclical in a positive sense isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so so this is why why we've raised this issue of logical intellectual reasoning it can be it can assist us mm -hmm. to maintain a connection with the facts yeah that are coming via the conscience the trouble with us is internally is that we have a whole heap of fiction, mm -hmm. false things coming from our emotional state yeah. to our reasoning, our intellect. Yeah. Now, our intellect now has the decision to make. Is it going to keep hearing and believing and supporting this false construct mm -hmm. that God's truth through the operation of conscience is telling us it's false? Or is it going to say, hang on a sec, even though I believe that's true, mm -hmm. it must be false. Yeah. <laughs> and this is because this is what God's truth is sharing with yes. me. And I need to start seeing that this is true. This is the thing I need to start reasoning about. This is true. This is false. Instead of going, this is true. The yeah. unhealed emotional state is true. Yeah. And the other is false. Yes. The, the truth is false is what we're, we're really doing most of the time. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't call that logic. Yeah. That's just... Um, very um, psychologically understandable. Yes. Um, but it, but it is very detrimental. Mm -hmm. False reasoning. Yeah. Which impacts our lives, like severely, mm -hmm. severely enough to cause unhappiness for tens, hundreds, and sometimes I've seen people in thousands of years of unhappiness because of this false reasoning. Yeah. It would be far better if they heard the conscience. <laughs> yeah. And believed what they're hearing from the conscience to be true and supported that truth with their intellectual reasoning mm -hmm. and then looked at their emotional condition and said, well, they're just how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that would be a sign of humility. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So as we've seen, um, when I'm humble, I'm going to automatically be more open to God's truth, yep. uh, making it much easier for God to share truth with me via the conscience mechanism. Exactly. My humility is a benefit to to myself and of course to others mm -hmm. uh, to myself in that i won't i will no longer be holding on to false beliefs and concepts that harm me but also to others because usually when i hold on to false beliefs and concepts that harm me i usually harm others with yeah my false beliefs and concepts yes. as well yeah. so so it would be beneficial to myself and others mm. Mm. and and obviously in this section we're talking about not just how humility affects sensitivity to the conscience but also our willingness to obey the messages of the conscience or to live in harmony with the truth that the conscience is conveying. Yes. And clearly, from the state you've just described, we're obviously going to be more willing to act as well, aren't we? That's right. If we're just imbibing the false reasoning that's coming from our emotional state mm -hmm. and we're supporting it with our intellectual thoughts, mm -hmm. obviously we're going to be very, very resistive to obedience to what God's truth that's coming through the conscience. Mm. And so we're going to oppose it. We're going to say, no, that's a bunch of bullshit to be frank. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not going to do it yeah. is what is the way you're going to react. And it's going to probably be a very angry reaction too, yeah. which is also an indication that there's a problem. Because <laughs> yeah. if you're angrily reacting to the truth, yeah. which obviously will benefit you, yeah. then it proves that there must be some very unhealed painful emotions painful. that you need to feel yeah. in order to get into a state where you're capable of logical reasoning. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you.